Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Thunderstruck, our look back at the career of Jushin Thunder Liger and looking at some of his greatest matches as picked by each and every yeah, unique standalone guest on this series. My name is W.H. Park. I, of course, do the uh, Post Perez uh, podcast with John Pollock over at postwrestling.com. Not over there. Oh, sorry. Here at postwrestling.com because it's also where you hear Thunderstrike as well. Uh, joining me today, I'm very excited. Uh, my my guest host today is the uh, is a, is a independent wrestler from Canada of world renown. He's wrestling all over the United States, all over Canada. And recently, he just came back from a tour of Europe. His name is Daniel Makabe. Daniel, how are you? I am very well. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this was, yeah, I really appreciate you reaching out to me and uh, and stoked to get to talk about this match that we watched today. So so you and I, this is not our first conversation because you and I met in person in Toronto back in August uh, via, I think, a mutual acquaintance of ours is uh, Travis because he messaged me, Travis messaged me and said that you were in the, the same venue as I was watching the uh I think it was like the, the WXW Ambition Show, which you wrestled on. I was like, oh, re- okay, that's cool. I, I don't know why anyone really wants to meet me personally, but that was cool. So we we met and I like John, John Pollock was there as well. We all three of us had a nice chat together. So that, that was actually a very pleasant experience for me. I was like, I really got the sense that, okay, you're someone I would definitely want to talk to about like old school wrestling from the 90s. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I... I'm trying to remember it might have been the next day because i uh yeah i did the ambition show on the on the thursday and then the standalone wxw show on the friday and um because i remember i think seeing you post about the ambition show and, and going oh i didn't realize that you were there i would have liked to have meet you know meet you and then you know we we met the following day on on the wxw show that i actually wasn't even supposed to be on that show it was a very last minute replacement uh for someone who couldn't get into the country so uh so i was lucky enough to to get to wrestle twice uh, for wxw in toronto but uh but yeah then we did have a very nice conversation the three of us that uh i think kind of got rushed along a little bit because they were kind of trying to get people out of the out of the venue um and probably get set up for the uh, the evening show that that night but um but yeah no i I agree wholeheartedly that uh, I I could have talked for hours with you guys there that that day and uh and hopefully we don't talk for hours today because the listeners might get bored but uh but I'm enjoying uh I'm looking forward to this conversation that we're we're about to have. So let's talk about um first of all like your history as a wrestling fan. I want to know like what got you into professional wrestling as a fan and what led you to maybe a fandom of maybe one Jushin Thunder Liger. <sighs> So uh, my fandom started. Um, I mean, this kind of kind of dates me. People are always surprised that I'm I'm as old as I am. But um, the first big wrestling show that I watched, I think I'd seen it on TV here and there, and I liked it, but I wasn't like blown away by it. But my dad took me to see WrestleMania Seven on closed circuit here in Vancouver when they still did closed circuit before like pay per view was super widespread. Um, so we went to watch it like on the Sunday afternoon and the Pacific Coliseum in Vancouver where like the Canucks play and like where they'd have concerts and stuff. And, uh, and I was like instantaneously hooked by just the whole spectacle of it. And I was, um, just a major WWF fan from that point on. Um, and it was through that, you know, wanting to see like all wrestling that was on television and, you know, all the syndicated programs on the weekends. And, uh, you know, there were various uh, like local stations in Vancouver that would syndicate the various WWF product. Um, but also TSN at the time, I don't even remember, they aired the WCW Power Hour um, on like Saturday nights. I, I seem to recall watching it as a kid because um, I didn't get like TBS to get Saturday night or, uh, you know, any of their other like uh, programs. Um and so, yeah, I just became a fan of like all wrestling, started buying magazines religiously or or asking my parents to buy buy me magazines. And um, that's sort of where the fandom of wrestling itself came from. I think the first time I can recall like hearing of or seeing Jushin Liger was reading an after mag. And I don't think it was PWI. I think it was one of the other ones like Inside Wrestling or The Wrestler. And they did like a full like – you know, six or eight page spread, um, with results and, and, 
and reviewing um, Super Brawl 2 um, from early 1992, which, of course, was the famous Jushin Liger versus Brian Pillman match, which I'd be shocked if someone else on this series isn't going to talk about that match because um, it's pretty legendary. Um, and I remember seeing pictures of him in in the after mags and, and maybe even some like full color ones They because Liger, I know like Bill Apter was a big fan and of Mil Mascaris back in the day. And I think he probably had a, a similar view towards Liger as, as being like this larger than life character who probably could sell a lot of magazines. And I mean, he wasn't incorrect because here I was as like an eight year old child who was fascinated by the pictures I was seeing of Jushin Liger in the magazines. So that's great. And so from there, would you say you kind of uh, try and do more research on Liger, maybe some other, Japanese wrestlers that you got into Perez uh, to some extent? Yeah. So I, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I liked, I mostly watched WWF and WCW throughout the nineties. It wasn't until, um, I was a teenager in the late nineties and, um, got more into, um, ECW again, you know, hearing about ECW in, in, in the after mags and then, yeah, c- kind of the age of a, like 14, 15, I started to become a, um, a tape trader and started to buy a lot of tapes. Um, and that's where the, um, the Japanese stuff really kind of came in. And admittedly, I remember kind of the rule of thumb. Um, although I think if you look back nowadays, it's kind of, it's kind of dumb, um, and not correct, but people would always say that you'd, you'd watch all Japan for the heavyweights and new Japan for the junior heavyweights. And nowadays I think you look back and, and the all Japan junior heavyweight scene is like really underrated, like criminally underrated. And the new Japan heavyweight scenes, not as underrated. Like I think people recognize that it was always good. They just, they just were more drawn towards the junior heavyweight scene. Um, but when I was a teenager, yeah, it was all about, uh, you know, the four pillars in all Japan and then all the junior guys such as Liger, El Samurai, Otani, Kanemoto, um, you know, Benoit, Guerrero, Malenko, all, you know, New Japan really did have such a deep junior division in the nineties. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I was watching a lot of that stuff as well as a lot of Japanese independence. I was really drawn to Michinoku pro and Torimon and battle arts, which I can talk into uh, infinity of my love for that promotion. And yeah, you seem very much like a, like a okay. like a battle arts type of person. So I'm not surprised that you say that. Yeah, th- I mean it's it's a huge inspiration on my style um, for sure, and also yeah, I just loved watching it um, as as a teenager. I really got into it. And speaking of us meeting in Toronto, another person that I got to meet in Toronto was Yuki Ishikawa from Battle Arts, and that was. Uh, pretty darn amazing. If I can be so so blunt, uh, yeah, I it was a great experience getting to meet him and and see him wrestle live and uh, and uh, and learn a little bit from him. So yeah, no, I can understand that feeling. I I last uh, it was last January I met uh, I finally met Jin Akiyama at an All Japan show. Like I bought a T shirt from him and I was just like so elated. I got a picture with him. Such a nice guy to me. So I can understand that feeling of like being fanboyish to meeting like someone that you watched when you were you know just like younger as a fan and who meant so much to you as a wrestler as a as a wrestling fan so I completely understand that so daniel let's talk about like now like you you are a professional wrestler you it's not your full-time job but like it is something that you do you spend a lot of time doing like you travel so many different places how did you get started in professional wrestling um Truthfully, it came from uh, I. It's no secret because I've been booked in multiple matches this year that kind of reference this fact. But uh, I was a backyard wrestler with friends of mine, and when we um, were looking for a venue to have our our matches and our shows, we used to rent out a local um, ring from like a local wrestling school here in Vancouver. And after doing that for like six months. The school, the guy who ran the school was like, oh, you guys, like, there's some potential here. Have you ever considered, like, actually training and and doing this? And I never actually thought about going that far. But when he suggested it, it seemed like 
yeah, okay, this is logical. So, uh, so I got trained in the summer of 2003, had my first professional match in the fall of 2003, um, and had a few matches, but, um, the promotion that we worked for, uh, it, it eventually was kind of mismanaged and went out of business. Um, and my friends and I, who had all gotten trained, we kind of had, um, we had a better time doing our backyard stuff. So we went back to doing that. I kind of went off and did other things. I played in bands. Uh, I traveled a bunch. I just didn't do much wrestling for quite a few years. And then, um, about five years ago, uh, some friends of mine were starting up a promotion, uh, or starting to run monthly, uh, promotion in Seattle, Washington called three, two, one battle. And they reached out to us about going down there to work for them. And so I started working monthly down in Seattle for three, two, one battle. And from there, things started to roll again. And, and I kind of decided this is something that I enjoy and I'm, you know, I'm decent at. And so I started to try and get more dates around the area. And, uh, you know, I started to get more opportunities, wrestling bigger names. And it just kind of kept on rolling to where we are here in the, the fall of 2019. And uh, I've had, uh, you know, a fair share of, of matches this year. I've traveled all over North America, been to Europe twice in the last month and a half. Um, and, uh, yeah, building a bit of a name for myself and and loving it in the process yeah definitely i think the first time i heard of you was like some buzz you were getting i think it was in three two one attack i think it was a match with timothy thatcher would that be correct like did you wrestle him in three two one attack that three two one battle yeah that attack, would sorry. be no no worries uh yeah uh, i've said this before uh and it i mean it maybe it's embarrassing but but i think it's the truth and i'm if anything i try to be honest um I, I so I've had a series of matches with Tim Thatcher. I wrestled him three times in three to one battle. Um the last three Julys. So we had matches in July of 2017, 2018, and 2019 uh in Seattle. And the match, the first one that we had in July of 2017, is the only reason that anyone knows who I am. Is is kind of what I what I'll say. And that might be a, a bit of hyperbolic, but um yeah, that match went incredibly well. And um, uh, some friends of mine saw it and wrote some really nice words about it. And then they kind of shared it around, um, what I'd call like with the, the independent Twitter kind of wrestling scene and some more people who had, um, maybe more influence, uh, started talking about it and sharing it. And, uh, it got a lot of eyes on it that year. And, uh, and that's kind of the reason why I'm here today because, you know, people, you know, everyone knew who Tim Thatcher was and had a lot of uh, respect for him and his work. But no one at the time really knew who I who I was. And uh, and they saw me hanging in there with with one of the best in the world and thought, oh, maybe we should be paying attention to this guy as well. So definitely, definitely. I was like, I was like, really? OK, who's this guy? I never heard of him. Oh, he's from Canada. OK, I'm Canadian. I I will, you know, kind of gravitate towards supporting people from Canada and then I watched the match and I'm like oh my god this guy held his own with Tim Thatcher and then I would watch some of like some of your other matches I, I recently watched I think it was the match you had with Tony Deppin was it the Scenic City Invitational yeah and I thought that was a really great match and I've and I've kind of like go out of my way if I see something of yours on YouTube I, I'll try to take, make the time to watch it so very very impressed with your body of work so far Daniel I, I appreciate it. I'm hoping to further grow that body as as we keep going. So sounds great. So let's talk about t- today's match. We we want to kind of keep the listeners in. They they tuned in to hear us talk about Jushin Liger versus which match did you pick? Uh, so we um, admittedly, I'll, I'll reveal the curtain a little bit. You ha- kind of had to 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 drag this drag this out of me because. You presented a list to me of all the matches that had already been picked for this series, and and there's so many good Liger matches. But admittedly, a lot of the ones that that immediately sprung to mind had already been selected, and so you kind of uh, spoon fed me this and 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 thought, okay, well, who's your favorite Liger opponent then? And to me, the the logical one was is Shinjiro Otani. But um, the match that in my brain was the more famous and maybe the better one uh, from March of '96. Um, sorry to reveal anything, but ha- had already been selected on on your list. And you said, well, 
you know, there's this one from February of 97 that, that I recall being quite good. And I, I'm pretty sure I had seen it, but but not in quite some time. But it did seem to have some pretty high regards. And I felt like, uh, yeah, Liger Otani in 97, that sounds pretty good to me. So uh, let's let's give it a whirl. And uh, yeah, that was a that was a good call on, on your behalf because this match was awesome. It so. was awesome. So. Uh, but, so just for some more details, so it's uh, Jushin Liger versus Shinjiro Otani, uh, February 9th, 1997 for the uh, the J-Crown title. And I'll talk about what the J-Crown title is in a, in a minute. But uh, this, this show emanates from the Nakajima Sports Center in Sapporo in Hokkaido, Japan, which is the northern part of Japan. So it's February. So it's if, if, if you're from Canada and you're from Toronto, basically Hokkaido, Sapporo in February is very similar to Toronto in February. So it's really fucking cold up there and it's really snowy. So just letting people have some uh, background information about the geography of Japan here. Uh, so uh, the J crown, like Daniel, can you talk about the J crown? Do you know what yeah, titles I, consist of the J crown? I couldn't list off all eight titles that consisted. I could maybe name like three or four. I know there's a couple different NWA and UWA titles. Uh, I believe the WWF junior title was in there, like the original one from the 70s. Um, obviously, the IWGP junior title was in there. Um, it's a uh, It was a tournament it, that was run um, kind of hand in hand with the G1 in 96. Um, and it was like the eight, eight junior champions, all with different junior belts. And it was a single elimination tournament to crown, um, you know, the kind of they basically unified all the titles into one giant title which i can't imagine that ever happening again <laughs> but but i guess 1996 was a different uh time and place and and honestly like i think a lot of it centered around liger like everyone had so much respect for liger and i think it was his idea probably um to bring it all together i could be wrong there i you know correct me if i'm wrong but um and and so yeah i know um uh sasuke won it originally i believe and then he lost it to Ultimo Dragon, which, um, you know, most people's familiarity with the J-Crown kind of centers around Dragon because he came out with it a couple times uh, for WCW, I think on Nitro a few times. And he maybe even defended against Dean Malenko at Starcade 96, I want to say. Um, and then he lost it to Liger, I want to say, at the January 4th Dome show in 97. Yes, you're fine. And and here we are with Liger now in, in the spring or I guess uh, late winter of 97 here with the J-Crown, which I forgot. Like the the entrances are always so impressive when someone was holding the J-Crown. But there's a moment in this match which felt like um, it was very cinematic where they the, the camera work is kind of focusing on the ring. And then it pans over to, you know, the timekeeper's table. And there's these eight belts that are very neatly organized, kind of slightly overlapping one another. And it's not until you sort of see them all there in this giant giant mass of, of title belt that's kind of like oh that's su such a cool visual that's not really replicated nowadays so you're correct so this is a it's a, a kind of idea created by jushin liger he wanted to create like this kind of unifying title for the juniors of japan i think maybe he was somewhat inspired by like what giant baba did with the triple crown in all japan but the thing with the triple crown is that those are all associated titles with all japan pro wrestling these are eight titles associated with different companies. So he, his idea was to like, just for the, for the time at that time, have this tournament and why not at the end of the tournament, have one guy hold all the belts for like eight different promotions. So I'm just going to list the different, the different titles that were part of the J crown. First, we have the British Commonwealth uh, junior heavyweight title, which is from Michinoku pro. Uh, number two is of course the IWGP junior heavyweight title from new Japan pro wrestling. Number three is the NWA World Junior Heavyweight title, which was associated with, of course, the, the NWA. Uh, number four is the NWA uh, World Welterweight title, which is uh, a title associated with CMLL. Uh, number five, the UWA World Junior Light Heavyweight title, uh, associated with both the UWA and Michinoku Pro. I think through uh, the connection there would be Gran Hamada. Uh, number six, the War International Junior Heavyweight title, which, of course, with uh, associated with uh, Jenny Chiro Tenru's uh, war promotion. Number seven, the WWA World Junior Light Heavyweight title from the WWA promotion. And finally, the WWF Light Heavyweight title. It's it's actually, I, Daniel, I've got to say, like I originally thought this was the Junior Heavyweight title that Tatsumi Fujinami held, but this is actually the uh, 
light heavyweight title that like would eventually make its way back onto like WWF television on on Raw with uh, with Takamichi Inoki, Brian Christopher, and people like that. But this was created uh, for uh, for the UWA. This is like a could like a co promoted title with that that the WWF gave to uh, the UWA promotion in Mexico. And it just kind of migrated overall to move over to, you know, Japan through the Great Sasuke, uh, El Samurai, Ultimate Dragon, and like through the Drake Crown, of course. But like basically the Great Sasuke was like kind of the, the connection of how it eventually made its way into the J Crown. At some point, the WWF said, hey, we want that title back. <laughs> I think it's... I think that happened with a couple of the, the belts over the course, like maybe two or three of them, the, the promotions asked for them back. And then that's kind of what led to them finally saying, OK, let's just um, dissolve this this J crown. And maybe in 98. Is that when that happened? Yeah, or? basically, my understanding is that the WWF finally realized that, you know, New Japan for Wrestling, which is affiliated with WCW at the time had one of their titles and they were like, no, we want that back. So they wanted the physical belt back. And of course they're not going to say no here. Yeah, here it goes. And that just kind of created this domino effect where they said, well, we, we kind of lost all these other titles. So let's just like dissolve this. We, we only want to defend the, the, uh, the IWGP junior heavyweight title. The other thing is, I got to say, probably, you know, the, you talk about the entrances, like for, for the J crown. So a lot of the times the champion would come out with these bikini models who would hold the titles for the champion and then, like, hold them after the match is won. And I got to say, well, you know, bikini models are not, you know, don't work for free. So they're probably like, well, let's just cut some costs. We don't need to have the bikini models come out if we don't have all these belts. So probably, you know, a cost-cutting measure as well. It, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's definitely pretty uh, grandiose and lavish, the uh, the notion of uh, of eight titles, and I can only imagine traveling, having to be the guy who has to travel. Like, hopefully, the promotion would hold on to it, but uh, but yeah, traveling with that that many titles would would be a real nuisance as well. Yes, so definitely. maybe maybe for the best that the J Crown uh, uh, was uh, not long for this world. No, I, I got to think that uh, they Liger or whoever didn't necessarily have to travel, like carry all this stuff with them, probably they took care of the, the transport of the titles themselves. Like what Ultimo did from j- between Japan and coming to America for WCW, I, I have no idea. But while they were in Japan, I'm pretty sure they didn't have to lug it around in their own luggage. Uh, so we should just mention that at this point, uh, so Jason Thunder Liger is the defending champion. He did, in fact, defeat Ultimo Dragon at the uh, 1997 uh, you know, t- Tokyo Dome show on January 4th, which is now the show we refer to now as Wrestle Kingdom. So he is the third champion at this point, and this is his first title fence against Shigeru Tani in, in, in Sapporo in Hokkaido. So let's talk about, uh, let's get into the match. And uh, first off, we just really um, uh, got to say, like, you know, Kanemoto, Takaiwa, and Otani are like kind of this unofficial kind of group that hate Jushin Thunder Liger, that hates, like, uh, El Samurai that hates basically this group that's at that time known as the Junior Horsemen, and the, the commentary talks about this group in the in the uh, in the match and like in Japanese. So basically, this is like so you have Otani, Takaiwa, and uh, Kochi Kanemoto are are all like kind of these kind of like you know I don't know what you would say. They, they wear basic black. They basically wear their young lions gear essentially, and they 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 hate all the colorful wrestlers and they hate all the the foreign wrestlers that wrestle in the New Japan Junior Division. So that includes. Liger, Samurai, uh, Wild Pegasus, who is Chris Benoit, and Black Tiger 2, who is Eddie Guerrero. This also migrates into a hatred of people like the Great Sasuke and Ultimo Dragon as well. So it's really interesting to see that the first thing that happens in this match is that Otani goes over and offers his hand uh, for handshake to Liger, and Liger's looking at his hand, and he's thinking, is this a trick? Should I shake it? But he, he reluctantly shakes it, and there's no trick. He Like, Otani wants to show his sportsmanship and he knows the importance of this match for his for him and so it was a really nice touch to see that happen in this match daniel uh i yeah it's uh spoiler alert it's, it's short-lived <laughs> i mean they they're they're plenty sportsmen sportsmen like to to begin with um and as you mentioned kanemoto's in is in otani's corner and i believe samurai is in uh, Liger's corner, which I, I like that. The, like having cornermen, I think that's a nice touch. Even if they don't do anything, they're just kind of there as as moral support and to kind of uh, 
um, you know, root their guy on. But uh, but yeah, no sportsman sportsmanship to start, and then uh, as soon as the bell rings, we're we're off to the races. Yeah, definitely. The the referee for this match is uh, Tiger Hattori, who I gotta say did an excellent job as a referee in this match. I'll, I'll mention some of the things that I liked uh, that he did throughout uh, the, th- this review. So yeah, so we start off with a really strong collar and elbow tie up, and I've been told like you can tell how intense or how good a match might be if there is a really, really intense like elbow collar and elbow lockup. And definitely we got a very intense one here. Daniel is a, is a, is a harbinger of things to come. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, they're really tight on the collar and elbow. Um, there's um, a lot of jockeying for position around the ropes in the corner. Um, Otani is even using Liger's like horn from his mask almost to kind of get leverage a little bit They're um, it, it gets pretty aggressive. Um, admittedly, I watched a few of their matches from, from that era just to sort of see um, how they played off of one another. And this is kind of a common, common theme I noticed is that these guys have really aggressive hot starts with, with the collar and elbow. Um, but this is the, this is like the most intense version of that um, where it was like no nonsense and like um, and working it for a good amount of time too. you know, like this isn't a short match. They there's a lot of time for things to to breathe and build properly and which I really appreciated, um, you know, the fact that they spent like a good you know minute um, just on this collar and elbow um, and really just kind of setting the tone of, of how intense and aggressive this match is going to be. Yeah, there's already like this in this first minute, there's already this like air of tension that's going to play out throughout the rest of the match. Uh, after they break up this first lockup, they go back to a second one. And this goes to the ropes where Liger slaps Otani instead of breaking cleanly. So you you, you get the feeling, OK, Liger is the de facto babyface in this, but he's not messing around in this match. He is going to like go full tilt and do whatever it takes to beat Shinjiro Otani, who at this point has been, you know, been developing a name for himself. He's probably one of the most lauded wrestlers in the entire world, not just in New Japan, not just in, in Japanese wrestling, but in the entire world. Like, you know, he's someone like some people like Dave Meltzer would be like raving about in, in the newsletter. And, and like people were like, who's this Otani guy? And checking out their matches and then they're going to be raving. So I, I think he's one of the most buzzworthy wrestlers in 1997 at this point, Daniel. Uh, absolutely and completely deservedly so um people from w you know uh north america would be familiar from uh he uh i mean he was the first wcw cruiserweight champion um in 96 beating benoit for it and so he had some matches on wcw television in that era probably most famously was he had a, a match with eddie guerrero on Starcade 95 um that was really good um but yeah it's crazy to think that he's so um, like heralded and I think he's only maybe five years in like I, I don't recall exactly when he started but I want to say it's like 92 or 93 um, and yeah no it's all deserved deservedly so he's um, he's amazing and and nowadays I don't feel like he gets his just due for people you know looking back in 2019 eyes like anyone who actually takes the time to look back on this um, will recognize how good he is but um but nowadays, I, I don't think he's a name that people throw around as much as they probably should. But. No, we, we could talk about that. Like, you know, it's, it has a lot to do with, like, the history of his career from, like, the 2000s on. Um, but, yeah, you're, you're correct. He debuted June 25th on, in 1992. So he's five years in. And he's already this amazing. It goes. That's insane. That's so crazy. But, but, but it's, but it's indicative kind of, of, like, the, the New Japan, like, trading system. Because, like, I, I don't think Kanemoto is that far out into his career or Takaiwa either. These guys are all basically generational peers and they're all three of these guys are so good yeah yeah no you're quite right and even the same thing like i think nagata was a 92 guy um and he's already you know really good by this point as well and uh tenzan and kojima were both like 92 93 and uh and it's crazy to think (laughs) just the level of talent that that promotion had and like you said the process that they use to kind of cultivate that talent um, and get them to the point where, yeah, five years in and having this like kind of generational match already. That's, that's crazy. I, that's, that's impressive. (laughs) From, from this point, Liger gives Otani a big backdrop and then follows up with this drop kick to the knee, uh, to his left knee. And this is one of the big stories in this match is Liger is that Liger is continually working over Otani's left leg and knee throughout this entire match, Daniel. 
Yeah, and and uh, not to um, to stray too far from this match, but but I watched the their match from '96 that I had previously mentioned, and that was um, kind of a common theme um, shared between the two matches was was the the leg work. Um, and, and the, the arm work eventually from Otani. Um, so I, I thought it was nice, like, um, kind of right out the gates, um, you know, super intense. I think Otani kind of hit him immediately with a, uh, one of his spin spinning kicks and then he, you know, grabbed a headlock and tried to gain kind of control of the situation after, you know, kind of jockeying and seeing, okay, who's going to take charge from the get go, he grabs a headlock and, and Liger backdrops him out of it. Like, no, no, you're not, we're not there yet. Uh, and then, yeah, turns it around on that, that drop kick to the knee. And, uh, one thing that I did know that, you know, we're about a year removed from that previous match that I watched. And, uh, even though Otani's great and he's only five years in, but I think the fact that he hasn't worn knee pads for five years has finally caught up to him um, because he's got uh, sleeves on both knees uh, for this matchup. And uh, it makes sense that, you know, someone um, – Otani is not someone you would necessarily think of as like a traditional high flyer in 2019 terms. Um, but in 1997, he's someone who really um, – he wasn't like an originator or an innovator of the springboard, but he's someone who really used it effectively and popularized it with springboard drop kicks and springboard spin wheel kicks. And not only did he uh, kind of effectively use them, but like um, use them in like high profile moments within his matches, um, which is something that I don't think gets done quite as often nowadays, but um but I, I I loved it. That was something I was really drawn to Otani when I was younger was his use of, of springboard drop kicks in like really dramatic moments to set things up, not to foreshadow to later in this match. But um, but it makes sense that Liger would be going after the uh, uh, on a guy who um, a lot of his offense is stems from being able to springboard and, and come off the ropes. Definitely, so. definitely. So Liger's strategy at this point is just like continual striking to the knee, uh, like stomping on it and driving his knees into there. Also using leg locks, knee bars, the Indian death lock at one point. And the other thing we got to kind of remember is that one of Liger's finishing moves is the figure four leg lock, which he, he lifts from you know his fandom of one uh, Ric Flair. So it's, at some point, maybe we, we would, might see the, the, the finish of this match might be the, the figure four leg lock. We, we don't know yet because we're, we're running through the match as it is. But one note before we get back into the match, Daniel, like I want to mention like the, the evolution of Otani's like uh, gear is, is really interesting because basically he starts off with the basic Young Lions gear. So black trunks and, and black boots. So that's his look for many, many years. At some point in 97 or 96, he, he gets the, the leg sleeves, as you're talking about. Not traditional knee pads, but kind of more like, I suppose they're like the braces. And underneath those, you can see there's a hole where the knees are, and that his his knees are heavily taped up at this point. And at some point, you know, in I think probably around 98, he finally gets wrist tape. I'm like, wow, he's he's moving up the, the ladder because he's, he's getting more, more and more stuff that he can up he's allowed to wear in the ring. And at some point he gets, he gets, you know, like the, uh, traditional knee pads. So at that point, that's like probably around 98, late 98, 99, 2000, that we see, you know, a fully formed Shinjiro Tani wrist tape, black trunks, pr- traditional knee pads and his black boots. Plus his like colorful red and black jacket that we see in, at the beginning of this match. Yeah. And then I, I eventually would add, uh, you know, the red to the tights, but that wasn't until zero one, I don't think. Right. That's but. after his, his excursion to, I think he went to Canada for his excursion and then he came back and he became a heavyweight. He dyed his hair. He had the, the black and red trunks. And then recently he's gone back to the all black look, you know, he, cause he reformed his tag team with Takaiwa. Yeah. I was, I was actually lucky enough to see him wrestle in New Jersey, uh, this past April against, Jonathan Gresham and yeah he just wore the he was back to the the black the black look um and, and honestly like compared to some of the pictures I'd seen of him in recent years I mean he was looking very good uh in that match against Gresham like he'd slimmed down quite a bit moved really well um and yeah no but but yeah everything comes full circle right it does yeah and uh, you know it's kind of funny when I watch like early Otani compared to like watching him in current zero one is that you know he now looks like your typical like 
you know, Japanese dad. Like he looks like a guy who's like the 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 branch office manager of like a photocopying company or something. <laughs> he like Xerox or something like that with his because of his hairline and stuff. So I'm always like, mm, I kind of wish he would just like shave that. But at the same time, it's it's kind of endearing seeing like someone with that kind of a hairstyle in, in in professional wrestling and someone who wrestles at you know kind of a like a high level for for someone who's probably got all this wear and tear on his body. Yeah, yeah, I I wasn't going to go to the hairline thing, but you're quite right. I don't care. I, 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 I go where other people don't in terms of people's, you know, aesthetics. It's, it's okay. It's kind of my gimmick. But but Fair. from from here, there's a great mat sequence where Rotani is in the Indian deathlock. And he's trying to escape and he, he, he breaks it up by attempting, I guess it's either a Kimura or a Keylock armbar. Which, which one would you say it, would, it was? It was a Kimura. It's a Kimura. So he's going for the Kimura. And he's from the bottom. He's working from the bottom. So he's able to get this kind of not fully on Liger, but enough where Liger breaks the hold on him and he's able to escape that. Uh, this forces Liger to tr- transition to a leg lock to escape. And uh, he grabs Otani's legs and he's he's holding with it. But Otani is, you know, this is kind of playing into his strategy, I think, because from this move, he's able to get some traction and... To, enough to slide over to the ropes to break the hold. Uh, but from here, then Liger just assaults the left knee by driving his own knees into it. He does it. He breaks the hold, but he just like, I will, I'm not letting you off easy. I'm just going to just drive my knees into yours. It's really great stuff. The sequence. Yeah. You know, that, that was great. I, I was, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, yeah. Grabbing the, the Khmer or the, or the double wrist lock from the bottom. Um, that's a very nice, uh, counter, like not even, um, necessarily an offensive move but more of a a defensive move to neutralize liger um but it almost just kind of serves to rile liger up even more and get more aggressive with the leg work like like you mentioned um and even to the point where he's kind of grinding like knee on knee uh onto otani like as otani's in the corner and he's just like kind of driving him into the corner with with the knee work um even though you know Tori's laying like a count on him but he's um just kind of continually like, go 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 that's the thing like anyone who um is not necessarily a fan of like mat based uh pro wrestling um i can't imagine them being being bored by this i mean i can but i don't understand it because uh even though it, it's not um you know, the first half, I would say, of this match is really Matt centric. Um, and there's not a lot of um, like high spots uh, happening. Um, but it's always something is always happening. And it's uh, it's really aggressive. And t- t- someone like me, um, there's lots of little change and nuance that I really appreciate. And uh, I think it's really, really fascinating and, and kind of continues to be more fascinating as we delve more uh, into the story uh, and uh, Otani kind of uh, getting back up on, on top of Liger as we progress. I think the the point that I like to make about like this type of mat work that you see in like the New Japan Junior Division with like, you know, Otani Liger and people like, you know, when, when he was wrestling there, Chris Benoit and, and uh, Koji Kanemoto is that it's really fluid. It's, it's, it's like there's kind of a dynana, dynamic element to it where they're just kind of kind of moving back and forth. Not, not like, like Zack Sabre Jr., who's, who's very fluid and very dynamic, but there's a speed to him that doesn't exist in the 90s junior scene at this time where they're kind of just like, you know, progressing, not slowly, but fluidly through their moment m- movements from like, uh, you know, like this kind of uh, submission hold to this leg lock to this arm bar, et cetera, et cetera. But like you're saying, like, it's not just a mat based move. That's a mat based match that at some point uh, from this point, like we see that uh, they get into one of the corners and there's this big back and forth strike exchange between the two that lasts a really good, I don't know, two to four minutes. And it, 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 again, it, it's an escalation of the intensity of this match, which is already pre- at a pretty high level. Yeah, and and if if I recall correctly, I'm I'm trying to remember. There's a moment where he kind of pins Otani like both of his legs over the ropes. I I might be jumping ahead, but like and gives him a capo kick in the corner, and um and yeah, no, it's um it it it's starting to build for sure, and, and it's 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 fitting ba- based on where we get eventually. But um, no, you're you're quite right in that um, these guys are always 
looking for something. And, and that's something that I really appreciate and I try to implement when I'm wrestling is that even if you're on the defensive or when um, maybe you're in a less than advantageous um, position, um, you're trying to find a way out of it and maybe trying for either an escape or uh, an offensive maneuver of your own. And and I, I love watching these kind of guys uh, working in that kind of manner, and, and and they do it really well here, for sure. And at kind of these, the opening, I'll say third, or, or maybe 40% of the match. Uh, from here, Otani finally gains an extended advantage over Liger by uh, grounding him and going to work on his left arm, including this amazing spot where Otani has the arm pinned to the mat and starts rubbing his knee into it. It's just like, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I actually like a full admission. I, um, I took, I wrote that down, um, as something to, to maybe, uh, st- start utilizing myself. Like he does like, uh, like a traditional, like Fujiwara arm bar that Yoshiaki Fujiwara, you know, kind of invented or popularized. Um, he didn't invent it. It's a judo move, but, um, but, uh, popularized in pro wrestling and, uh, Otani kind of brings it to like a, a an even like meaner version where he's got the the kind of the standard Fujiwara on and and it's not enough that where he kind of shifts his weight up onto his hips and then in addition to the you know using your arms to to create the pressure on the shoulder he drives his knee in there too and I, I thought it was so mean and uh and looked like really impressive and and full admission i wrote it down as something that i will probably start using myself I, so. i'm going to be keeping an eye out for that if i see it in like on vod i'm gonna be like i know where you got that from uh from here uh, there's a really elaborate uh like uh, like technical wrestling sequence liger escapes otani's assault on his arm by getting hold of otani's left leg again and transi- transitioning to a top position where Liger switches to working over Otani's arm this time. And from here, Otani takes control again from Liger by grabbing a hold of uh, Liger's legs and grinding his knee into Liger's ankle. And I'm like, oh my god, this is beautiful. This is just absolutely beautiful professional wrestling I'm watching at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, that that's one thing that I think when wrestlers first learn... Um, you know, to use that, that, that style of wrestling and, and tell stories in that manner that you think you have to be just like, okay, I'm working, uh, the leg. So I'm just going to go after his leg this entire, this entire time. Right. But, um, you know, if, if you're really in a struggle with, with your opponent, right, you're going to find, uh, openings and opportunities where, where they arise. Right. So, um, if, you know, Liger, is uh is you know needing to find an opportunity and and the arm opens itself up to him you know and, and it's kind of um yeah it's it's a nice kind of bit of poetic license as well with the uh you know uh, turning what we're what we've come to expect so far in this match kind of turning it on its head and kind of mirroring where where we're at and these guys sort of okay this guy's been working my arm to gain an advantage well now i'm going to do the same thing oh well this guy's been working my leg to gain an advantage adva- bleh, an advantage so i'm going to do the same thing you know it's it's kind of a fun twist on on the classic uh storytelling that uh that you'd see in this kind of match it feels more like a real fight doesn't it if if they, if you're just any any kind of opening doesn't matter what it is like okay i was working over the leg that traditionally in wrestling that you stay with one body part but if I see an opening, I see a realistic opening, I'm going to grab that. So that's kind of more the Japanese style, kind of what, you know, what people call strong style. That's kind of an aspect of it. Um, but from here, from from the ankle, uh, Otani goes back to working over the left arm of Liger. Uh, I, and I thought this is really excellent psychology at this point. Like okay, he got he 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 regained the advantage from Liger by using his legs, but he knows what body part he wants to go after, and it's his left arm. Uh, Otani hits a single arm DDT and follows up with a painful looking wrist lock when he turns it into kind of a leverage move of moving Liger's arm over his own shoulder. And there, like, Otani's kind of like got his, his arm over his shoulder, and he's kind of like kind of priming it, so to speak. And then he does the big arm breaker that you would see someone like Yuji Nagata typically use. Yeah, and that I, I feel like that was. To that point, that you know, the arm work was there, but uh, he did the the big kind of over the shoulder arm breaker, and and that kind of really set it off as okay. Now this is like intense. Like Liger does this big like kind of like 
scream like uh, to sell it. And uh, and um, Hattori, you know, checks on him to make sure everything's OK. And that's when we start getting some like real serious, um, you know, we're not quite in the near falls yet, but but some serious like near submissions where, um, you know, Otani gets on um, like some cross arm breakers and stuff. And uh, one thing that I that I kind of wanted to bring up that I think sort of fits in this part of the match, and this might be me reading it, into it a little bit too much, but it, it, it's something that I myself do, is that anytime Liger is in a hold, um, he's, you know, not only is he, is he trying to work for a better position, try to escape the hold, try to, to find a way out or whatever, but even, even when, um, in, in kind of the early stages of this match, um, uh, if Otani is kind of uh, testing him with something uh, or maybe working for something but doesn't have it quite locked in and um, there's a few moments where they're, they're really near the ropes, Liger is always trying to um, find a way out and try and kind of reverse the position so that he can wind up in an offensive position. He's not quick to take the, the rope break uh, as an out um, versus Otani. There's a couple times where um, they're kind of in an opposite situation and, and Otani does go, go to the ropes, which I mean, that's just kind of a little, little heel face kind of uh, dynamic that, um, that they worked really nicely. That that's very subtle, but, but I really appreciate it in, in the earlier stages of the match. Yeah, it definitely goes to show you like how smart Liger is. And this is kind of a point where he is kind of transitioning into doing more, a technical wrestling style. I think like the the wear and tear of like doing all the like you know shooting star presses and dives out to the the floor are, are really taking their toll. Not that that we're not not going to see those. We're definitely going to see that kind of Liger. In I was like, we're we're about we're about to see a, a big cross body to the floor. By exactly. Liger, so exactly. So from here, I don't want to get too much into like. Uh, into the granular analysis of the, of the mat work at this point. I, I think people get a very good sense of like how you and I feel like you and I love it, but like, I think people might, you know, not want to be hearing about it all the time throughout no, this review. No, no. Honestly, it's the kind of stuff that like, you know, the, the stereotypical, like very traditional Japanese crowd, very respectful, very attentive. It's the kind of thing that like, I think if you sit down and watch it with open eyes, um, and and pay attention to it you'll really appreciate it but um but yeah listening to the two of us talk about it ad nauseum might might not be the best um uh uh maybe not the most entertaining audio no maybe, maybe uh, not but, but, it's, but it's I, fun to I, talk I assure, about it but i assure you i assure you it's good and it's worth your attention and and obviously it's just helping to kind of like we said it, it builds the intensity to where we we get um to you know the the final third of the match i would say where things get really intense so. yeah so basically from from this point liger signals the, the the second phase of the match so basically the first phase was the was the mat work and now we're in the second phase and liger like basically uh, enters that phase by giving otani a huge capo kick the one that you referenced earlier in the corner that sends uh otani to the floor and from here liger climbs up to the top rope and then he dives he does the crossbody block from the top rope onto Otani, who is on the floor. And I, I think poor Otani probably maybe has smacked his head a little on the exposed concrete floor of the uh, Nakajima Sports Center here. Yeah, yeah, he probably did. Uh, um, yeah, no, that was um, – that felt very much like a switch. Like, um, okay, you know, we're we're kind of going back and forth and we're building the intensity here. And then, yeah, here's the capo kick, and it's like, oh, like, switch has been hit. Oh, here's a dive. Okay, like, now here we go. Like, buckle up because cause you're in for a ride from this point on. And the crowd at this point is like, they know, okay, it's on. This is what, you know, this is, we we're, 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 we love, maybe they don't love, but they, they like, they're respectful, as you were saying, to the, the mat work that was happening. But now, okay, this is what we want to see from Shinjiro Tani and Jishin Liger. Um, on the floor, there's a really good point. I just want to quickly say, like, we're, like I mentioned Taiko Hattori. Taiko Hattori is the ref of this match. There's a great point where, like, you see, like, Kanemoto and Takaiwa checking over on Otani, and then Taiko Hattori, he comes out to do that himself, and he just pushes them away. He just, like, like signals, get away. Get, get away from them. Like, don't interfere in this match. And they just listen to him. They respect him. They respect the authority of the referee, and they move away. And to me, that is so... Wonderful and refreshing to see, especially compared to 2019 New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yeah, they've kind of haven't done themselves any favors with uh, 
how the referees are kind of portrayed and and uh, and um, very. I mean, like Ghetto is obviously very influenced by American booking uh, of the of years past, but um, but yeah, no, you're you're quite right. I I do appreciate that as as well. And and the one thing I I just wanted to mention really quickly is I was shocked when you you mentioned at the beginning of, of the record that this took place in Hokkaido, especially in February, because uh, I mean. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like they're kind of notoriously not like a particularly receptive crowd. Maybe that's just a current phenomenon, but um, but they like they really show their appreciation uh, as the match kind of uh, builds and grows, and by the end they're they're really up for it. So I think in in crowds in 1990s is very different from crowds in the 2000s, and, and even like we're having a very hot period, especially in New Japan. Uh, there's, those crowds are still going to be like, you know, anywhere in Japan are going to be super, super hot, whether they're in Tokyo, whether they're in Osaka, Nagoya, Yokohama, Hokkaido, or down in Fukuoka, wherever. Like, those generally are, are very hot crowds. Like, these days, like, I do think Sapporo is actually a very, um, very wrestling centric town because they don't get so much of, uh, like, so much wrestling up there. It's it, like all the companies do, do, like, shows up there, but they don't get the frequency of shows that, like, say, Tokyo does. So it, yeah. it's something I think like a lot of people in Hokkaido appreciate seeing, being able to see, uh, especially like this is the main event of the show. This is so rare that a junior heavyweight title match is the main event, but it goes to show you like the, the kind of, you know, cachet Jushin Liger has in 1997 and like really also like, like how much, how much they, they, the, the office and the, the fans respect Shinjiro Tani, because this looks like I don't know what the attendance was of this of this show, but it, it looks like a very very respectable crowd in this building. Yeah, oh, yeah, fair fair enough. Then that was a misconception that I had, but um, but yeah, no, it, I I think it was pretty well attended. Like they had the big ramp out, so it, it's a fairly large building, and uh, and uh, and yeah, they're hot for sure throughout throughout the match, or uh, certainly near the end. So. So from the ground, uh, Liger recovers first from his big uh, body dive onto Liger onto Otani from the top rope, and he picks up Otani and, and gives him a power bomb to the mats covering the concrete floor. So these are the the very thin looking blue mats. So I gotta think this is not a good day for Shinjiro Otani at this point. No, yeah, no, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I I don't really want to get power bombed on the floor on, on my the best of days. So. Um, but that's just like that L- Liger would do that occasionally and, uh, and kind of, uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> in, it, it helps to, to build the intensity and kind of, you know, Liger is going to take over here or, or at least he, he hopes to, um, and what better way to kind of put a, an exclamation mark on it than just power bombing someone on the floor <laughs> exactly well otani has the same idea because he's able to reverse a whip into the barricades and then he gives liger a power bomb of his own onto the floor as a big receipt to to the earlier power bomb uh from there otani hits uh liger with a rolling dive off of the apron onto the floor uh liger gets back into the ring and and dodges otani's springboard drop kick and applies a la magistral cradle for only a two count it's a it's the first of the big two counts that that are going to be we're going to be seeing from this point on daniel yes yeah it's the first and something that that i love um liger was always really smart especially in this era about incorporating like little roll-ups like this into kind of the back closing stretches of matches and he was able to effectively use them as like viable false finishes and uh, part of that stems from dating back to um, the the original tournament for the J Crown that we that we referenced back in August of '96, where Liger actually lost in the first round of that tournament to Ultimo Dragon with a Lamai Estrell Cradle in like two minutes. They had this like really intense sprint, and part of it was because Liger actually had to take some time off because he had a brain tumor. Um, and I think that kind of led to him, uh, a lot of him, you mentioned, you know, all the years of shooting star presses and moonsaults, but I think the brain tumor also kind of led to him slowing down his style a little bit and kind of adapting more of the map based style. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it's finishes like that, you know, having a guy go over you in two minutes, um, with a little cradle, you know, it just shows you like how smart Liger was kind of being the sacrificial lamb to get over, not only get over dragon, but get over, 
um, little like cradles and roll ups as viable finishes. And, and then here we are less than a year later and he's using it as a, uh, as a false finish to, you know, great effect. From, from here, Liger follows up with a top rope Frankensteiner that Otani is able to roll through into his own huge two count. Uh, Otani is awesome here. He, so he thinks he's won the match, but he hasn't. He only got a two, but his facial expressions and his body language as well, the way he just expresses his emotion of not only frustration, but like throughout the match, like anger and like despair, even like he is so good. I think it's one of the things that I latched onto early on when I first discovered him. Like, oh my God, I, I just want to ride this emotional roller coaster with him based on just his facial expressions alone. He's so great at these things, Daniel. Yeah. So, so from this point on, like, no, like, obviously this is a Jushin Thunder Liger centric podcast, but, um, for like, for my money, o- Otani is the better performer in this match. And a lot of that is kind of stemming from like the back quarter where his performance is like truly next level. Like the way that he emotes exhaustion, the way that he emotes, um, you know, just, uh, the emotional kind of roller coaster of, of all of the false finishes and his frustration and uh like it's it's amazing honestly like and yet you're quite right he he rolls through the frankensteiner gets a sunset flip of his own and i love you know in in today's wrestling i feel like moments like this would kind of be glossed over they would you know do the roll through you'd get the the big false finish off the sunset flip one two kick out they'd be immediately up running into the next high spot but here um you know otani is kind of selling the emotion of what no i reversed him that had to be it and and liger is is kind of selling the uh you know both his move being reversed but also the what I got out of that, right? Okay. You know, like they, they took a moment and they, they let it breathe and let the people really register what was happening. And then they built up to the next false finish, you know? So, uh, I mean, this is, this isn't a short match by any means. Like, I think it goes upwards of like 27 minutes, something like that. Yes. But, um, but, uh, um, you know, they still pack a lot in, but they still allow themselves a lot of time to really let this stuff register. And I think that's kind of a lost start. But but for, for my money, it, it, it's really Otani who uh, it puts in the 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 Academy Award winning performance in this match. Uh, I totally agree for, with you. Totally. Like yeah. he is the, the guy that I think the crowd is really getting into. And at this point, like you can hear the, the volume of the crowd is definitely rising. The, the heat in the building is definitely rising. Uh, from here, Otani flips out of a German suplex attempt from Liger and hits Liger with his signature spinning leg lariat, or I guess you would say his wheel kick. Uh, and that's one of like one of his more graceful looking moves. And like as, like you're saying, like you don't necessarily see Shinjiro Otani and think high flyer, but he did a lot of like beautiful looking like jumping like drop kicks and and leg lariats and and wheel kicks and and things like that and he and his springboard we'll talk about his springboard moves as we get to them but they're just absolutely so beautiful just how graceful he is at hitting someone in the back of the head from the top rope like not many people are like that maybe Kota Bushi these days maybe even like Kazushika Okada but like in 1997 very few people are as graceful as Shinjiro Otani uh from here he hits his own German suplex with this beautiful bridge for a two count. Uh, another great reaction from Otani expressing his frustration. That, that German, but that was such a beautiful bridge. Why, why isn't that the finish? Yeah, he's, uh, he's the man <laughs> Like when it comes to that kind of stuff. You're, you're quite right. He's um, super graceful. His springboards look like nobody else's. Like He has his own kind of style. The way he kind of brings himself up to the ropes uh, are really different than, than most people do them. Um, and uh, and you're quite right. He he's one of the only few people that I've ever seen do the springboard wheel kick. The only one that that jumps to mind is Hayabusa would do the springboard wheel kicks as well. Um, and then yeah, he he goes for the the dragon suplex, which is kind of his finish. Uh, uh, Liger breaks the full Nelson really quick, but it it's you know it's not for long because Otani gets him over with a real snappy German suplex with a bridge. Um, I'm trying to think like maybe the nicest German suplexes in, in pro wrestling history. Like he's up there, you know, he's definitely like, up there. Yeah. 
yeah, like so much snap and impact, but like so much grace in the landing and and just beautiful looking. Like he's he's an all timer for well, sure. Well, you definitely uh, know that. That's where Kotobushi gets his snap German suplexes. That's from Shinjiro Otani. It has to I, be. I, I think you're right. So so here's where I'm going to be a, a contrarian, um, and this is my my one kind of nitpick um, uh, of this match in that. Uh, as good at um, selling the emotion and the exhaustion that Otani is, um, me personally, as someone who's really finicky when it comes to this sort of stuff, when he's putting his own matches together, I don't love that Liger spent, you know, the first kind of third of the match just you know, uh, obliterating Otani's knees that are, that are basically exposed. Like he, you know, he has these sleeves, but like you mentioned, you can tell that they're taped under there. Um, and you know, really just kind of taking it apart for someone who, um, you know, it, it's a logical, um, game plan to, to utilize against someone who, um, you, you know, uses the springboards and uses the, the jumping kicks and stuff. Right. But, um, all I, all I would love and and I would honestly I wouldn't say a thing if they if they did this is a, a moment or two where Otani you know uh the the groundwork that uh, that Liger has laid comes back to Han Otani and he he's unable to hit the springboard or he's unable to hold the bridge um so, uh, just little things like that are something that I really appreciate and look for in in a wrestling match and Otani uh, while he does sell sell the exhaustion and there, there's one moment where after it might be right after that German suplex where he kind of goes over to the corner to set up what his next attack is going to be. And he kind of stumbles over and, and, and you could conceivably um, it, it's from, you know, the leg work. But other than that, he doesn't do a great job of selling the leg for for my money. Um but your mileage may vary because I'm admittedly very nitpicky when it comes to this sort of stuff. And uh, it's something that I take a lot of time and effort to make sure uh, occurs in my matches. And so that kind of bummed me out if I'm being full, fully, fully honest. Um, but but that, that that's it. And like I said, that's a very small nitpick. So no, I think it's it's a fair like observation or criticism to make about the match like i think you know like we say how great of a psychologist is my my counter argument to that would be maybe just like he's running on adrenaline and it's just he's trying to beat liger so that's why he doesn't you know the 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 the, the, the real life physical effects of all that leg work are not are not affecting him like to the point where they're gonna stop him from hitting all his big moves and attempt to to beat Liger. But but from here, uh Otani whips Liger into the corner and follows him, but Liger wallops Otani with a big fucking lariat for a huge two count. And here and and, and he gets and the only reason it's a two count is because Otani is well aware of where he is and he grabs a rope to break the to break the, the count. Uh Liger starts selling. Because he uses his left arm for this lariat. He starts selling the effect because this is the arm that Hotani has been working over the entire first half of this match, Daniel. I- correct. Correct. Yes, I did notice that. <laughs> And it was like a uh, Larry. It's on a movie you see Liger do a lot of times too. So that kind of caught me off guard. Like, oh, he hits this kind of desperation lariat out of just you know he just swings wildly, and uh, and it happens to be the bad arm. And and yeah, he does he does come up selling it. So and kind of shaking it out. So yeah, props to Liger. I uh, from you know twenty two years later, I do appreciate your attention to detail. <laughs> exactly. Like he's just so smart. Like he's basically. But I think those like he has a a, a large larger you know wealth of experience to draw from like like okay i oh yeah this is the arm he worked on i gotta sell it i hit him with this move that you know would hurt me if like i you know i've been if this arm has been worn down the way it has been early in the match uh from here uh liger goes for his big moves including the running liger bomb for a two count uh otani floats out of this brain buster attempt and hits a graceful release german he follows up with an absolutely gorgeous springboard missile drop kick to the back of Liger's I don't know if it's his neck or his head whatever it looks beautiful and it looks like it it's gonna freaking kill you yeah no he he I don't think I can't I can't even think of anyone else who did the springboard like uh, like the NZ uh drop kick as well as Otani did like and like uh, full admission one of my like favorite uh, like I don't 
I, I try not to kind of catch myself, you know, for lack of a better term, like marking out. But, you know, there's there's a, a type of wrestling fan that really kind of react to people hitting their signature things or, or signature poses or, or whatever. But um, the only time that I can I can really think myself uh, where I find myself in that position nowadays is when Otani, you know, hits one of those big drop kicks and then he finds himself on his knees and he kind of does that, that double fist kind of raise that he does. I, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's his, his mannerism, like where he gets kind of all jacked up, like, okay, here we are now, now it's go time. We're going to, we're going to put this guy away. Um, I still get emotional when I see Otani kind of do that double fist raise. Like, I, I love it. Oh, it's so yeah. great. It's, it's basically yeah. him rallying himself and the crowd to get behind him to like, okay, I, I'm going to win this match. I'm going to win this match. It's just amazing. And and the crowd is super hot right now. You can just hear the, the, the heat coming from this crowd. They're, they're like, they're like stomping on the floor. They're so excited to see what's going to be happening next. Uh, from here, Otani hits a beautiful German, uh, dragon suplex with a bridge for a two count. Uh, Otani selling, like we said before, Daniel, this is so amazing. He looks like he's about to cry. He didn't, beat him with one of his signature finishing maneuvers, the dragon suplex with a bridge. I'm, I'm like, no, Otani, don't cry. You can still go. Get, Just keep going. Just keep going. And it's just, it just draws me into the match so well. Yeah, that's that's the big one. You know, like he teased it earlier with the with the dragon. Liger's able to break the full Nelson. He just hits the German. He finally hits the dragon. And, and that was his big one. And uh, and yeah, no, he was he was always like nowadays. Uh, a lot of pro wrestlers kind of fall into the trap of, you know, big false finish kick out and like the what? No, like the shocked face that uh, and admittedly, like I'm I'm guilty of, of doing it myself. Um, but nobody had a better kind of shocked face than than Otani did. And, and it's not even so much shock. It's like it's a it's a range of emotions like frustration and and anger and like he looks like he's gonna cry you're quite right and uh and it's beautiful honestly absolutely gorgeous uh liger fights out of another dragon suplex attempt uh from here otani charges and ducks a shote from liger but liger is able to hit the second one for a big two count uh liger hits a fisherman buster but waves his hand basically saying he doesn't say anything but this hand wave this finger wave basically saying you're not getting off that easy asshole and then he gives him a second fisherman buster uh but no cover no cover he's not done with he's i think you can get the sense that liger is really pissed off at at otani and he wants to punish him at this point so from here he lifts him up to get him into a brain buster but uh, otani is able to reverse the brain buster in midair and he crashes by shifting his weight and he's able to crash all his weight down onto liger uh and like and kind of incapacitating him at this point yeah, so I, I I love this sequence, and and there's there's a few reasons why for it. So um, so like I mentioned, I, I watched their match from from March um, and uh, of '96. Um, and uh, spoilers for anyone who who's never seen it um, or or has heard about it, but the, the finish to that match is is the Shote. So so the first time that Liger hits the big Shote out of nowhere. Um, and it was the first time he hit it in that match. I, as I'm as I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, I would love if you kicked out of this right now. This this would be great building off of that that previous match, right? So so he does that, right? I love that. Okay, here we are. So then he gives him the fisherman buster and he waves off the no no. Here comes another one. I'm gonna really punish him. Similarly, in that previous match, Otani did the same thing to him. He gave him a dragon suplex. Didn't hold the bridge. Immediately did that. No no no. I'm gonna punish this guy and give him one more and and really get him here where so Liger you know it's kind of a nice little nod like hey I remember this guy being a real dickhead to me and and giving me two of his big moves you know deciding that wasn't that wasn't enough Liger does the same thing but then he he takes it to to a a new level and and he pays for it um you know going for the the follow-up brain buster and uh and yeah Otani using what like what I would call a cutback where he kind of changes the the trajectory of his landing and lands in a cross body and and similar to what I mentioned previously with that um that's uh sunset flip out of the Frankensteiner you know they use this as a nice break in the action and a, and a way to kind of build up you know what's still to come as opposed to just using it as kind of an ellipsis and uh okay now here's here's the next part you know there's it's so smartly paced and and worked 
and uh, at building emotion up to where you finally get that crescendo that that I love it. This whole segment was maybe my highlight of the match. Definitely. From uh, here, Otani puts Liger on the uh, top turnbuckle, but Liger hits a palm strike, knocking Otani down to the mat. But Otani's not going to stay down. He goes for a second attempt to get to the top rope. Uh, He gets knocked down by a headbutt. A third attempt, uh, uh, Liger levels Otani with an elbow to the face. Uh, But, you know, Otani just won't stay down. Fourth attempt, uh, Otani hits his own series of headbutts and finally hits his own Frankensteiner on Liger. So just the tenacity of of Otani on display here. It's just like he gets knocked down, but he won't. He just keeps fighting back up to the top rope. He's got to get Liger off this top rope with with a move of his own. He's not going to let Liger get out of this so easily. Yeah, if that last segment we were talking about isn't my favorite part of the match, this this is because this was this was a display. Like this was emotional storytelling. This was Otani like selling the the never give up kind of attitude. Um, yeah, this back and forth was was amazing. Like this was intense. I, I loved it. It was so good. Uh, from here, uh, 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 Otani slides under the bottom rope to the apron. And he starts priming, waiting for Liger to get up so he can hit his spinning uh, springboard, spinning uh, a wheel kick for a big two count. This is one of his like signature moves, along with the the springboard missile drop kick. Uh, just absolutely the one of the most graceful. You're talking earlier that Hayabusa also did this move, but I gotta say, you know, like you know, I like Hayabusa, and I think he's such a great high flyer in his own right. But to me, like there is a grace. This is a surprising grace to Otani's like like flying moves that like maybe Hayabusa, uh, of course he had as well, but like just this particular move, I just think you know Otani's is a smidge better than Hayabusa's. They're different for sure. I I, I think Hayabusa's may maybe more graceful in the traditional sense of the word. Um, I don't even know. There's a certain like je ne sais quoi about Otani's like flying moves. They they always look. They look graceful, but they also look brutal at the same time. Like they look super damaging um, at the same time as being like really uh, beautiful to watch. Um, maybe a little bit more so than anyone else who who's done that move. Yeah. So from here, uh, you know, he only gets a two from the uh, the wheel kick, but he tries for three more pin attempts. But Liger kicks out all of them, and at this point, both men like are absolutely spent. Like we're, I think we're in like the 24, 25 minute mark of this match. Uh, Liger breaks out of the dragon suplex attempt and hits a shote. He goes for a second one, a third one, and finally the fourth one. So uh, the, th- the three previous ones don't like knock Otani down. He's like, w- like, like toughing it out. He's like, he's like telling Liger, I'm not going down for these. Finally, the fourth one staggers Otani. Who's running on a journal at this point, a fifth shote, a sixth one, a seventh one, eight, nine, and finally, uh, no, sorry, a ten. There's ten shotes in a row at this point, uh, Daniel, and it's just amazing. Like the the intent, the the tenacity, the the toughness, the the perseverance that Otani is showing throughout these like you know these this amazing barrage of shotes, which is one of Liger's signature moves on him. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah. The- the last like three, four minutes of this match, it, it, it's all about Otani like just holding on and, and and not willing to give up. So so it starts with with the Frankensteiner not being willing to give up. And then, you know, he finally gets him down with the, the wheel kick and and not giving up on the fact that like, well, that had to get him because the first fall, you know, uh, near fall off that wheel kick, there's kind of a weird moment where Otani kind of. You know, like Liger kicks out and Otani kind of jumps off of him. Like, you go, you've you got to be kidding me. Like, it almost felt like a finish. Like, Otani jumped up with, like, uh, the same kind of energy that someone would if, like, yes, that was successful. I've won the match. But but he jumps off of him like, no, you can't you can't be telling me this. This didn't work, right? And then we get the, the follow-up, uh, you know, pinfall attempts, which you normally don't see people utilizing this late in a match, that kind of um, – I don't know, technique or that element of storytelling, but, but it just really set to, to put over Otani's tenacity. And then, like you said, Liger kind of takes back over and he hits these, these show tays. Um, when, when you say show tays, so, so it is the palm strike, but it's not like the, the traditional kind of running one. This almost feels like, 
more uh, of like a big like classic heavyweight boxing match in that um you know liger they're they're in the pocket they're within striking distance and and um Otani's kind of hunched down in, in almost like a sumo position where he's kind of like standing his ground like I'm not going anywhere and Liger is kind of digging deep within and he he throws a big one and, and he's alternating hands too with the right and the left. He's kind of going rocking them back and forth and and, and Otani almost takes like a like a classic boxer position like um, there's a, a classic phrase of, of biting down on your mouth guard and uh, and just kind of staying in the fight even if you're down in the fight kind of like – you know, doing your best to to take the punishment that that's being given to you, and and that's what he does here uh, until uh, you know, like you said, nine or ten shotes in a row, and and he's finally staggered and, and he can he can take no more. Yeah. So from this point, Liger hits the ropes this time, and he hits the eleventh and final shote, and finally puts Otani down for the one, two, three. Uh, Liger retains the J crown in 27 minutes and 14 seconds. And this is an amazing, amazing match. Probably one of my favorite encounters between Liger and Otani. We, of course, we talk about the, the 96 match. We reference that. That, that will be reviewed. We're, we're not doing these in order, Daniel. So that'll be reviewed in a future show. Oh, I'm sorry for, for, no, for no, 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 don't worry for. about it. And then, and then of course, we're also going to be reviewing the, the 98 match between these two as well but for for my money like you know this is like for people watching these out of sequence as well it's fine i don't think it's necessary to be able to watch these in order like i think going back and watching something that uh, precluded precluded this is like is is fine as kind of a a case study so to speak for for what happens in this match but just amazing oh last overall final thoughts about this match daniel um yeah, this was honestly – this was great. Um, great performance by both guys. Um, great escalation of work. Um, I love the intensity and like I said, the, the closing stretch and especially you know the performance by both guys. But, but, but Otani especially is amazing in this match and Liger has maybe less of a, of a, a standout – uh, performance uh, as far as the emotion goes, but it's um, maybe more of a uh, reserved isn't the right word, but it's more of a um, subdued. Uh, yeah, subdued. That's a good word. Yeah, subdued or mature kind of performance. Like there's a lot of little things that that he offers that that Otani's the very big, over the top, dramatic emotion that really sucks you in. But Liger uh, adds a little bit uh, layers of of nuance that uh, that Otani doesn't necessarily do that. Yeah, it's a very complete performance, I'll say, from both guys working together. Uh, amazing storytelling, great action, great false finishes. Um, a lot of a lot of stuff that you don't see in 2019 wrestling that I think a lot of people would be smart to you know to have matches along these lines. Uh, uh, yeah, I loved it and and would highly recommend anyone who who's never seen it go out of your way and watch it, or or if you have seen it, rewatch it because uh, yeah, it. It holds up incredibly well. Um, you know, in, in 2019, I, I think this match would be just as amazing. So oh, Definitely, definitely. I think for, for me, I think this is a perfect showcase of Liger as a complete wrestler. Not only the, the high-risk aerial wrestler, but also, like, the incredibly intelligent and, like, uh, methodical and strategic technical wrestler that he that he is under that that bodysuit and that and that really like you know over the top mask uh for otani i think you know this this match really i think cemented him as like in the pantheon of liger's greatest rivals up there with wild pegasus up there with uh el samurai and up there with koji kanemoto he's in that rarefied like you know of the top four i'm gonna say he's in there maybe he's number one actually because like i can't think of too many other people that can get the kind of intense Liger that we see. Of course, you know, Kanemoto, Benoit, and, and and like Samurai, you you see like that intensity. But there is something different when it's Otani and Liger in in, in the opposite sides of the ring. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, he's he's number one as far as Liger opponents goes for me. And uh, and I appreciate you suggesting this match as the one we kind of go to because. Um, I, I, I thought it was great and, and it was, uh, you know, my favorite Liger, uh, Otani match that I've seen, uh, the two of them have against, uh, one another. And, um, 
And you're quite right. You know, at this point, we got to remember Liger is 13 years into his career at this point. And he's um, he's grown a whole heck of a lot. And he's, um, you know, there is still some high flying, but there is the technical wrestling and there is, you know, kind of the the power wrestling and there's, you know, the the psychology and and he's just such a complete performer. And it, it's crazy to think that, you know, at this point in his career, he he's had some injuries and he's had some health setbacks and he's done, you know, he's done a lot like he's he's wrestled all over the world for a lot of promotions. And uh, and it's amazing to think, you know, how far he'd come at this point and how far he still had to go at, at this point. So, yeah. On that note, uh, let's wrap it up here. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. On a really fun edition of, of Thunderstruck. Uh, I really enjoyed watching this match, but also uh, reliving it with you and just getting some really great insights from you as a professional wrestler into the things that were, were happening in this match. So for the listeners, where can if people want to find out uh, like about your future dates and the future appearances or get your thoughts on what kind of music you're listening to, where can people find you? I was going to say you, you kind of uh, let everyone know. Uh, yeah, follow, follow me on Twitter uh, at Daniel Makabe, D A N I E L M A K A B E. Um, there you can find out about all my upcoming dates um, all over. You know, I, I am based in the Pacific Northwest, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, but you can see me wrestle quite regularly in the states of Washington and Oregon, as well as here in British Columbia. Um, I do have dates scheduled into early 2020 all over the world however so if you see me uh come into your town by all means please come check me out come say hi um i love meeting people and just getting to talk about whatever uh, another thing you will find that if you do follow me on twitter is that i do give daily music recommendations uh recently um you know and quite often i will have themes to you know my weeks uh as as things go on i I give a daily music recommendation uh sundays i give a full album um recently i've done uh canadian 90s cancon which you yourself uh wh led uh to message me about a bunch of 80s canadian cancon that you wanted me to check out and uh i've been in the process of doing so but uh but yeah so uh, come check me out. Uh, if you, if you have heard of me, if you've never heard of me, I appreciate all the support and, and thank you once again for this opportunity. I, I, uh, it's honestly going to lead to me watching a bunch more, uh, Jushin Liger and also a bunch more Shinjiro Hotani, to be perfectly honest, um, that I, uh, I haven't seen in quite some time. And, and I think it's a really nice project that you're doing to, um, not only for, for your own benefit and, and the people you have on, but the people who are listening at home to hopefully appreciate, uh, one of the greatest of all time, if not the greatest of all time, who, uh, will be packing it up in just over, wow, four months, two months, yeah, probably like yeah, January, two, January 5th. And then his retirement is January, January. Yeah, Retirement that's only is, that's uh, January 6th. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually got tickets to go to that show. So I'm really excited. I'm so incredibly jealous. I will. Uh, yeah, I unfortunately will not be there, but uh, I can't wait to see it uh, on video. Yeah. So so hopefully uh, one of these uh, one of these days, your travels will will bring you to Japan. If I if I'm still around uh, and you're in Tokyo, you're doing a show in Tokyo, like we'll, we'll uh, maybe hopefully meet up and go out for dinner or something like that in the future. That sounds like beyond amazing to me. That's, uh, uh, you know, all I've done so far in, in wrestling in the last three years, getting to go to Europe, getting to go all over the U.S. But uh, but uh, as being uh, such a fan of Japanese wrestling for all these years, you know, going on 20 years now, uh, I'd love to make it over there sometime. And, and hopefully in the near future, I'll be able to do so. Hopefully, hopefully. And then we'll uh, we'll wax poetically about uh the 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 wonders of the toronto uh, music scene from uh, queen street west from the 1980s if uh, instead of talking about wrestling but uh on behalf of daniel thanks for everyone for for listening for as long as you have this is gonna clock in at just under uh, just under 90 minutes but i think it's a compelling 90 minutes of audio and if you if you're loving thunder truck so far you're gonna love this i hope you love this episode just as much uh you can follow me at wh park nine on Twitter. And of course, uh, until the next episode, I will say to everyone, goodbye. <laughs>